So hello NMR community and welcome to this short video series organized in the context of the visual encyclopedia of NMR by the group Moampere. My name is Alex and I'm going to walk with you through today's encyclopedia entry which is going to be about a theoretical treatment of rotations of Hamiltonians, of NMR Hamiltonians. And one thing that we are going to look into detail is why are rotations essential for the theoretical treatment of NMR in general and specifically how rotations are important to understand the anisotropy problem of solid state NMR and to understand what the effect of magic angle spinning is on the resolution of solid state NMR spectra. It's an extended topic, so it's also going to be a bit of a more extended encyclopedia entry than we're normally used to. And you see the program that we have here on the right. First of all, we talk about Hamiltonians in general, and we want to introduce some of the basic NMR Hamiltonians in Cartesian coordinates. Then we will move on to understanding why the rotations are important for and ubiquitous in NMR and to understand the theoretical treatment of NMR, that's what we already said. Then we will also look at why Cartesian coordinates are not exactly the right coordinates to do this theoretical treatment, why it can become rather cumbersome to uh, rotate Hamiltonians in Cartesian coordinate and why do we need a different notations for making the um, rotation simpler. And finally, we're going to introduce this different notation, which is the so-called spherical tensor notation of Hamiltonians, which will allow us to simplify greatly the rotation treatment of Hamiltonians. We're talking here especially about Wigner rotations. We will look in detail about what they are. And finally, I want to conclude on a practical example where we'll really take the dipole coupling Hamiltonian in the principal axis, axis system, and we are going to rotate it into the laboratory frame in spherical tensor notation with Wigner rotation matrix such that you really see how these theoretical steps are carried out uh, in practice. And the basic fundamental quantity that we are going to analyze in a lot of depth in the next videos is the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian in general is a quantum mechanical quantity that is used to describe the total energy of the system. And in this sense, it is very important because the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian correspond to the possible energy states that can be reached by the system. And this is particularly important for any sort of spectroscopy because spec what spectroscopy does is that it uses electromagnetic uh, irradiation in order to excite transitions between these energy states, create some detectable signal that can later be exploited to learn something about the molecules that we uh, want to investigate. And in particular, NMR is concerned about the energy transitions that we are able to excite with radio frequency pulses or in general with radio frequency irradiation between the energy states of the nuclear spins. And since we said that this course is going to be focused and a bit more oriented on solid state NMR, you may also already have heard that solid state NMR is a particularly challenging technique because the spectral lines are intrinsically broad, they are characterized by large overlap between the different resonances, and this leads to very poor spectral resolution. You are, not able to you are not able to associate individual signals to individual nuclei in your molecule, and this just complicates your analysis or makes it totally impossible. So you may have heard that in order to work against this and in order to mitigate the effect of these very broad lines, what has been introduced a long time ago is magic angle spinning. And that is that you're taking your sample and you're rotating it along uh, an axis, around an axis that is inclined, inclined by the so-called magic angle that is roughly 54.7 degrees, uh, degrees. And this uh, magic angle spinning, and we will see this in much more detail, also theoretical detail, is able to narrow your line widths, to increase the spectral resolution, and to make solid state NMR a very powerful technique for uh, molecular investigation. So what are our objectives today? What do we want to do today? You see it written down here. 
And what we want to do is we want to give, first of all, some very general expressions of writing down Hamiltonians in Cartesian coordinates. So really general expressions that can be applied to any Hamiltonian you want that you would encounter in NMR. And then we want to pick out a very specific example, and we are talking here about the example of the Zimmer interaction, and we want to use it in order to understand really what is the relation between the NMR Hamiltonian and the NMR spectrum, and how we can use this to predict spectral line positions. So let's jump right into it, and let's look at what we have on this slide here. So, basically, the Hamiltonian is an operator. And as soon as we decide on a coordinate system, as soon as we set a basis, then we are able to transform this Hamiltonian this thing from an operator form into a matrix form, which simplifies a lot our treatment. And in general, we want to use for the beginning Cartesian coordinates, and then at a certain point we will understand what the problem of Cartesian coordinates is and why we would like to use another basis that would then be in the end the spherical tensor notation. But this will come in the next videos, or in a few videos. And um, first of all, uh, Hamiltonians in NMR can be classified into two main categories. We can have spin field interactions and we can have spin spin interactions. Spin field interactions are all the interactions that take place between one nuclear spin and, for example, the external magnetic field, B0, or the RF field, so the uh, one that you use to really excite your transitions. And the very general form of a spin field interaction, you can see it written here on the side. What you basically do for the Hamiltonian is you take the vector of the nuclear spin operator, you multiply it by a coupling matrix A, and you multiply this again by the vector of our field. Either it's the B0 field or it is the RF field. And the only thing that changes between different interactions is the values that are assumed by this coupling matrix. And this coupling matrix describes the strength and the orientation dependence of our interaction. And for spin-spin interactions, it's not very different. Actually, if you look at the formula down here, actually, mm -hmm. you just take a uh, spin operator, you'd multiply it by the coupling matrix, and then you multiply it by the spin operator of the second spin. And examples of spin-spin interactions are the dipole coupling, the J coupling, but also some quadrupolar coupling. This sounds still very abstract, so let's look at an example. And let's look at the most simple example that we can have, the Zeeman Hamiltonian. And as we said, the only thing that changes between the different interactions when using these formulas is the value of our coupling matrix A. And in the case of the Zeeman Hamiltonian, the coupling matrix is really very simple because it's just minus the gyromagnetic ratio times the identity matrix. So it's Basically, it's a constant. And let's do this. Let's insert this value for our coupling matrix. So instead of A, we write just minus gamma times the identity. And what happens now is we just perform our multiplication and we see that what comes out is exactly the expression for the uh, Zeeman Hamiltonian that we know from basic NMR courses. So what we do is we first assume that our B0 field is oriented along the z-axis, meaning it's aligned with the z-axis. That means that it has no x component, no y component, so it's just a 0, 0 B0 uh, vector. So let's write everything out and let's do the matrix multiplication, this first matrix multiplication together. We start by the first row of our identity matrix, so from the i0, 0 row, and we multiply by 0, 0 B0. Take the sum, so we take each component, so 1 times 0 plus 0 times 0 plus 0 times B0, and we sum everything together. And this gives us the first entry of our new matrix, or in this case, it's just a vector. Then we proceed with the second row of our identity matrix. This is 0, 1, 0. We multiply it again by 0, 0, B0, and we take the sum for each component, for the multiplication of each component, giving us 0 times 0, plus 1 times 0, plus 0 times B0, and then you sum everything together, and again, you have just 0. 
as an entry for your new matrix resulting from the matrix multiplication. And you do exactly the same thing for the last row. Just here, the only difference is that the one is now paired with the B0, and that means that you will have a B0 in your last entry. So now you have just what is left is you have the multiplication between your nuclear spin vector, so ikx, iky, ikz, multiplied by your new vector that you obtained from the first matrix multiplication that it is still 0, 0, b0. You multiply them together and what you actually get now is the gyromagnetic minus the gyromagnetic ratio times ikx times 0 plus iky times 0 plus ikz times b0. So what remains in the end only the b0 times ikx term and this means that if you do the whole uh, multiplications, the whole matrix multiplication starting from the general formula, what you really get in the end is just the basic expression from our Hamiltonian, from our Zeeman Hamiltonian. It is actually the Zeeman Hamiltonian equals minus gamma, so the general magnetic ratio, times the external magnetic field strength, so b0, times ikx. And now let's go even a bit more deeper and let's use this Zeeman Hamiltonian to understand what energy transitions would we expect to come from such a Hamiltonian. And you see up here the general scheme that you can keep in mind on how you get from a Hamiltonian to a spectrum. There are multiple ways, it's not the only one, but it's the one that we are looking at here. So basically, as we said, we start from the Hamiltonian in the form of an operator, so with this hat on top. Then we choose a basis set, could be Cartesian coordinates, could be something else, but uh, in this case we use Cartesian coordinates. We transform it into a matrix form, and as soon as we have the matrix form, and it is not diagonal, so meaning that it has um, off-diagonal elements that are not zero, then what we do is we diagonalize the matrix such that we get a it in a diagonal form. This is done with linear algebra. You can do it on a computer nowadays, so you don't even need to bother doing all the calculations by hand anymore. Um, and in the case of the Zeeman Hamiltonian, it wasn't even really necessary because as you saw, the Zeeman Hamiltonian was already diagonal in the basis set that we choose. Finally, now, the as soon as it's in a diagonal form, each diagonal element corresponds to the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. And what did we say at the very beginning? We said that the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian correspond to the energy states that we have. So each eigenvalue will set us a certain energy level. And as we said, the transitions that are occurring between these energy levels, we can actually calculate them by taking the difference between the, by, between the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. So just taking the difference between two diagonal elements of the Hamiltonian will give you the transition, the position of your spectral lines that you can achieve from this Hamiltonian. Note that with this method, you're not taking into account the intensity, and it can also be that the intensity of a certain transition is zero. So, but here we focus only on the line position for an illustrative purpose. And now let's look at our Zeeman Hamiltonian and what can we say about it. We have it in our uh, standard expression that we just derived. And now you see that it still contains an, an a quantity, namely the ikz, that is in an operator form. So in order to transform this into a matrix form, we just use how the ikz operator looks in Cartesian coordinates, and this is just a Pauli matrix that is uh, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, times 1 half. So you basically just insert instead of the ikz the corresponding Pauli matrix, for a spin one half system, of course, and then what you get is the expression that you see here, where you have minus the general magnetic ratio times the B naught times one half times the Pauli matrix, and you see that the Pauli matrix is in diagonal form, and that's what we meant before. We do not need to diagonalize the Zeeman Hamiltonian in this basis set because it's already diagonal. So what we said is that the the, uh, the diagonal elements are our energy levels for the Hamiltonian and this means that our transition frequency position is going to be just the difference between these two elements. Well, what is the difference between these two elements? You have one half minus minus one half. This gives us one half plus one half, gives us 
1, and then you multiply this by minus gamma times B0, which is still standing in front of the matrix, and what you obtain in the end is that your transition frequency, omega 0, is equal to minus gamma times B0. We only have two energy levels in a spin one half system we, uh, with only one spin. We only have two energies, we have only one transition possible, and the transition frequency is equal to the Larmor frequency. So that was quite a lot for just one day, so let's wrap it up here and let's make a brief summary of the concept that we have seen in this video. We started by introducing the Hamiltonian as a general concept of quantum mechanics. We have said that the Hamiltonian characterizes the total energy of a system and that its eigenvalues correspond to the energies that you can actually achieve in your quantum system. We have said that in order to understand NMR spectra, it's important to understand the nuclear spin Hamiltonian. We have then moved forward and we have given for the two most common types of interaction in NMR uh, general expressions in Cartesian coordinates for our Hamiltonians. We have mainly talked about spin-spin interactions and spin-field interactions. We have then looked at a very specific example of a spin-field interaction, namely the Zeeman Hamiltonian, and we have calculated the expression for the Zeeman Hamiltonian starting from the very general expression for the spin-field Hamiltonian by doing some matrix multiplication and inserting the numbers relative to the Zeeman Hamiltonian. And then in the end we have used this to calculate the spectrum that we would obtain if we excite the transition um, that is obtained when we look at the energy levels of the Zeeman Hamiltonian, and we have seen that this exactly corresponds to the Lamo frequency of a certain nuclear spin. So this concludes our session of today. As you can see down there, you can directly click on the link to the go to the next video, where we're going to go a bit deeper, introduce some extra examples for Hamiltonians, namely the chemical shift and the dipole coupling that is going to be very important in solid state NMR. And we're going to introduce the uh, mathematical tool of the secular approximation that is very often used in NMR in the theoretical treatment of NMR. So thanks a lot for being with me today. It was a pleasure and I hope that you enjoyed it and I hope seeing you very soon again. So see you until next time. Ciao!